Hoor Anka, hoor jy my? Hoi, kan jy my hoor? Ah, kijk eens. Kan jy my nou hoor? Misschien is ek te saag. Ek gaan net my speke test. Test speaker. Hallo. Okay. Ehm. Ok, ek het het getoets, dit werk. Ok, het gaan goed met my. Ok, miskien moet ek jou... Ek kan vir jou hoor. Kan jy vir my hoor nou? Ek kan jou ook nou hoor. Ah! Ja, kan nou ja. Ok, goed. Ek kan jou hoor. Ek sien jy vang so'n wiekie sonskyn. Ja. Hoe weer is het tijd kry? Jy is goed? Ok. Ek is blij om vir jou te sien. Ehm... Ek denk ons gaan maar begin, want ons kyk maar wie sal nog kan join. So vandag, ons gaan praat oor iets wat dalk vir allemaal nie so opwindend is nie, maar dit is baie belangrik. En soos ek laas week gesê het, ek het maar gekyk na die eerste opstel wat jylle ingehandig het, die eerste assignment. Ek het gekyk waarmee jylle sikkel en toe het ek besluit, miskien met ons maar net weer dit een besoek aflee aan die aspekte in termen van geschiedenis. En ja, meeste mense het gesikkel met die Harvard Method. Partij het het glad nie gedoen nie. Ander het een poging aangewend tot een of ander bibliografie in die einde, maar het is glad nie die Harvard Method nie. So, in geschiedenis... Het ek het in die tijd ook tijd probeer nie? Ja, ja. Ja. Nou moet ek mooi onthou. Ek kan een persoon onthou wat het baie goed gedoen het. En dis iemand wat dit herhaals. Ek dink die mens het al geweet, oh, dit is baie moeilik. Dit is eindelijk nie moeilik nie, dit is net soos een recept. Jy moet dit net volg. So, ek het een... Jy het een bibliografie gehad, maar ek kan nou nie... Ek dink nie jy, wat jy nie gedoen het nie, is jy het nie die, wat in die bibliografie is, 
in die tekst geconnect nie. So, ons gaan, ek gaan vir jou nou vertel daarvan. Admit. Ok. Hi Zillit, Zillit is also going to join. Um, ok, so let me share my screen. Um, ok. Ok. So, um, let's just chat about um, Harvard referencing. Hi Zillit. Uh, you get different types of referencing systems. You get the APA that's usually used by psychologists. Um, you get a different referencing system that the BSc students are using. But because we are in the humanities, um, history and art and design falls under the humanities, we use the Harvard referencing system. Um, and referencing is a way that you demonstrate that you have extended your learning that what you have written in your assignment, you didn't just sit on a rock and it came to you, that you actually, that the research that you've done, that it fits within a larger framework of research, that's actually what you are proving. And when you are native, when you're studying diploma and when you're studying undergraduate, um, in terms of you, it's like you're putting your feet, you're dipping your feet, toes into the pool of the research world. So you are learning the ways of how research is conducted. Um, you are not expected to come up with new ideas, new types of research. That is only being done postgraduate. So, but you have to learn the steps. It's like when you're going to learn to drive. You hear a lot of people will tell you, oh, I know how to drive. But then when they actually go and um, undergo the test, they fail the test. And the reason being a lot of those people haven't learned the rules where you have to look in all the mirrors and you have to um, purposefully display to the examiner, the, the person who tests you during that driver's license, a dry, yeah, to, that you are looking in the different blind spots. And that's what you're basically doing in terms of your essay. You're going to show purposefully this idea, I've connected it to a larger body of work, to that idea, and this paragraph connects to that paragraph. So I didn't just drop it from the sky and now I want to have accolades. Because research is always a big body. There's a big body of research out there in humanities. And the purpose of research is the more research that we conduct, the wider we um, Span the scope of knowledge. So that's why we are conducting research, not just for ourselves, but to make our field a more academic and stronger field. So um, just talking about sources, you get different kinds of sources. You'll see you get primary sources when you conduct research and you can have secondary sources. So in your case, um, Primary sources, that is material that the author has written. And I would say, in terms of history of art, that would be the artwork itself. That would be the primary source. Um, but it could also be journals, if an artist had a journal and you're going to extract information from that journal, or interviews, that's anything that sort of, the person has said it and it's been written down. But the moment it gets interpreted, then it becomes what we call a secondary source. So um, undergraduate and diploma work relies a lot on that type of source. So you guys will rely a lot on secondary sources here on this. So that is interpretations, criticisms of other historians, research by other art historians and so forth about the primary source. So you are just displaying that you know how to read um, and you know how to extract those thoughts into an essay that makes sense, that has a follow through. It starts somewhere and it ends somewhere and it's got that golden thread. Um, it's not just these haphazard kind of ideas. So the one idea leads to the other. So the purpose of referencing is you let the reader know whose ideas you are using, who's the art historians, the philosophers, where did you tap into? You also give recognition to the original author of the text. Um, 
you enable the reader to check your information, whether your information is correct. But in the broader scheme of things, like I said, research is about expanding knowledge. So, so you ideally want people to read your essay and be so fascinated with, with what you have written. They actually want to know more. And that is why they go back and say, where, where did you hear this thing? What, how did you find this? And you, you go and look at the, uh, the site, and then you, from the site, you look at the bibliography, and the reader can, from the bibliography, actually go and find the source to extend their reading, to do more reading. You also confirm the completeness of the research. Um, and sorry for the typo, quotations and references lend authority to your argument, especially when you are in a, studying a diploma or an undergraduate, you are a newbie, you're new to this. So you show that you understand who the major art historians in that field is, or the critics of that field is, or if it's got to do, let's just keep with art history, so art historians the other researchers, the other sort of that you don't, you didn't quote a charlatan, but you actually understood, oh, this is a professor from a notable university. And this professor has conducted a lot of research within that field. So that you understand, you also display your understanding of what a good source is and what bad sources are. So you only include good sources in your assignment, then it shows that you know the work well. Um, and also by giving credit to each source used, the reader sees what the author has borrowed from other authors. And we can also see what is your own interpretation because you are obviously required to have some of your own interpretation, but some of that will be from somewhere else. And you need to recognize that and acknowledge that. Otherwise you are committing plagiarism because then you are pretending that you thought of this idea yourself, but actually you read it somewhere else from another art historian. So uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very serious aspect of your assignment and your essay. If you omit your bibliography, you basically um, commit plagiarism because you don't prove where your work has come from. And this is the thing that most students struggle with to understand. So you actually have your essay. This is the stuff that you've written. You need to connect your essay with your bibliography. So it seems a lot of students understand they need to cite their sources in the back so they have a bibliography, but they don't connect it. So you must imagine like it's a thread. So my bibliography, it threads my in-text reference is the connector I use to connect this source with this statement in my essay. So does that make sense? Zelit says no. Okay, so you need in your essay, you're going to write your essay. Here is your essay, like you have written it now. Everybody has already conducted an assignment. So they've written their essay and you have a thought and then your sources that you've used, they are in your bibliography. They're listed in the bibliography at the end. So this is my bibliography that's behind the essay. Now I have to, when I have a thought, when I have read something and I'm going to explain it in this paragraph, that which I have explained, I've used a book. So in this instance, I've taken Gardner's Art Through the Ages and I've taken it from that source and I have to, um, use an in-text reference to connect it to the source. So look at the next slide. You'll see this is the, this is the example um, sentence or paragraph. So I'm saying the Egyptians were able to establish their culture through the use of art as can be seen in their depiction of the human figure. That idea I didn't get from the sky. I got it from somewhere else. I got it from Kleiner et al. 2001. And here I can see the page number it's from. So if I then go back to the bibliography, um, then here's my Kleiner et al. Kleiner um, refers to multiple, 
multiple authors. So there's not just one author in this book. Okay, Art Through the Ages. So it says to me, Kleiner, Maimia, and Tanzi. There were three authors in this book. Okay, so I have referenced them here. I'll discuss how you do the Harvard method in a moment, but it's important that you understand that your bibliography, every source that is listed in the back of this bibliography, if there's no in-text reference or cite in your essay, then there's no point of listing it in your bibliography on the side at the back, okay? So if you don't have a way of connecting, of connecting what you have thought to something, then you might as well omit it because it is worthless. So I, as the reader, read your essay, and here in the, par in the parenthesis, I'm seeing, okay, this idea that you got from um, the using culture, the using the, um, the strengthen the, strengthening their culture by spe specific proportional relation by, um, in how they show the human figure, you got this idea from Kleiner et al. And this is the date of publication and the double point, it says to me that's the page number because this source is a hard copy book. Okay. Um, and you can see sort of, I'm also then continuing. Now I'm referencing an image. So in art history, you're always going to reference an image. So my image, and then I explain things with regards to the image. We'll discuss the image a little bit later. Is that, is that bit my more making more sense, Zillet? A, a little bit, okay, all right. Okay, then now we, now we can winning. So now we're looking at the bibliography at the back of the essay that you've written. Now I can say, okay, it's Kleiner et al. So now I come to, this is my make-believe bibliography. In this essay, I had three sources. And you can see it's um, listed alphabetically. So from the first author, it's B, K, T. -T. Um, so Kleiner, Mamiya, and Tanzi. So this shows me there were three authors in the source. This in the um, brackets shows the publication date. And this in italics, it tells me the title of the book, Gardener's Art Through the Ages. And it shows me it is the 11th edition. If the book doesn't have, it's the first edition, first print or third print, but first edition, you don't need to show it. But you usually need to show uh, books that have a different edition, they have been revised. So the third edition is older than the 11th edition and they, there's more information and the page numbers are not where they were in the third edition. So you have to indicate which edition it is as well. So this tells me the city it was published in, Orlando, and this is the name of the publisher, Harcourt College Publishers. And because it is such a huge book and it has multiple authors, I need to indicate the pages that I have used collectively. So I have used the chapter on the Egyptians and that's pages 17 to 41. So that when the researcher or the reader goes, they can really find it. So I don't know if you're gonna see on the screen, but when you have a hard copy book, okay? So this is my hard copy book. Obviously, there's the title, that's easy to find. And there it says to me, it's 11th edition. But most of the information, when you want to size a, cite a hard copy book, you find it in the first, in this page. So when you turn it, it tells you the publisher, it tells you the publishing date, it tells you the typeface that it's used, the fonts, um, it tells you uh, contributions, so it's usually in the beginning of the book, you'll see on the left-hand side that information, you'll all find, be able to find it there. You get the ISBN number, everything. So that's where you find that information for the hard copy books. Um, I'm just going to leave it here. Okay, 
So what you include in your bibliography in that reference, you need to include the name of the author or authors. You need to include the year it was published, the title of the source. So in this case, it's a book. The cities it was published, the publisher and the pages that you've used. So generally, we start with a book because that's the easiest way uh, reference example. This is the structure you would follow. So you take the last name of the author and then the first initials and then full stop. So you must have this um, punctuation marks correct. So you must follow it the way that they show. I will also email you guys links to examples of Harvard referencing lists where you can look up any kind of source. You can reference a DVD, you can reference an online video, you can reference an Instagram post. You must reference everything that you use. So you just follow kind of, you just look at what the structure is. Where must I put in the name? Where must I put in uh, the title? Usually some things are a little bit different for each source. So, but in general, this is the kind of structure for a book that you need. Like, Um, so, for example, this book, it has one source, so one author, so this is going to be quite easy. So, I'll have Marnen, comma, M, full stop. Then the year it was published, then I just look at here on the inside, uh, here, uh, copyright copyright there it tells me first time published 2014 so that's going to be in brackets then the title of the work that is phenomenology of practice full stop and then the city it was published in um, it says to me uh, New York and the publisher is uh, Rutledge. I don't know if you can see so well. Okay, so that's how you source everything that you've done. Um, and then, as I said, in your bibliography, then you cite them in alphabetical order. So also, so that people can find it easily. If I saw in the in your essay in that in-text reference, it's Kleiner, so it's K. Then I know K. I go A B C D blah blah blah, and that's how I find K. I don't have to literally look at every single source to find K because K might be in the beginning of the end. So it's also just for um, easier reference and easier way to find it. Um, and if you have sort of, maybe you found an author and you've used three books by that author, then you're gonna use the publication date. So the oldest book is gonna be listed first and the newest book at the bottom of that list. But I don't think you guys will have in your career here that kind of problem um, like i said like i've shown you already so if you've got multiple authors so i'm just going to show you some examples of sources that i think you'll use quite often so here you've got three authors so again you've got the last name of the author comma their surname full stop then it's comma because now it's the end of the first author now it's the second author and this, um, you usually use the, how it is in the book. So sometimes like in this example, the book, it was um, Fermat, Sebok and Freund, Campbell and Freidenberg. So four authors. And usually um, they will have the biggest or the largest contributor to the book will be first. So it's not always in their instance, alphabetical, if that makes sense. So in here, you can see V is in front of F because that is how it was indicated on the book in the front. So you just keep that order. Um, but sometimes like in Gardner's example, it was still alphabetical. Um, and it, you've got just, so now you just follow the kind of the rule, the guide. So now you've got Sabok, comma, S, full stop, comma. Now you've got your third author, fourth of, fourth one, and your fifth one, there's actually five. Full stop, there's the publication date in the brackets, full stop. In italics, we've got the title of the book, it's called Discovering Computers, so it stands out, I can easily find it. This is where it was published, 
So this is the publishing house um, or the publisher. In this case, it's actually from um, a institute and the, those are the pages that I've used. Um, I think you guys will actually use a lot of um, website based articles. So I looked at sort of how you reference a article found a, 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 in an academic journal, but it's on a database on a website um, because we don't have physical libraries. So this is the same. Now you just follow the rule. So when you find your source, you put in this, the surname, the initial, this is the year it was published. This is the article title. This is the only thing that's different with, um, from the book. The name of the journal is in italics and the title is not in italics. And you indicate in brackets that it's an online source and then you show the volume, the issue, the pages that you've used and any online source, it doesn't matter what it is, you always are going to show when you access that source. So available at, this is the URL. Um, and then here it, sh it says when I, so if I wrote this essay, this is the day I accessed this. I accessed it on 10 May 2020 or whatever. Be the reason you need to do it for an online source is because online sources, they aren't static. And someone can come three years later and actually change something on that information. And then when a researcher come and they try and look for it, it's not there. So that's why we need to show when it was accessed. Sometimes certain uh, websites crash or they disappear. So again, then that source is gone. So you must indicate when you've accessed it. So we can see when, you know, it was made or if there was, were any amendments made to it possibly. So you can see here in, in square bracks, you need to always show when, when you read it, when you accessed it from the internet, you as an individual, um, apart from when it was published, published online. So that was, it was published 2015, but I would have, if I did my essay now, I would have accessed it in 2020. Okay. Um, then uh, for magazines, so you guys can see, it starts to follow a kind of a pattern. So author, date, um, again, sort of magazines is like a journal. So that is going to be men's health. That is in italics. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to, you don't have to worry. I'll give this to you, the links to where you can find this. So when you cite a website, so again, the publishers, the person who wrote the article, the year it was published, the page title, you have to indicate it's online. Then you give the name of the website, then you give the URL. Um, like you can see in my examples here at the bottom as well. We'll talk a, a little bit later about what is a good source, what is a bad source for online internet sources. Um, okay, and then dictionary entry. I don't want to spend too much time because I don't know how crap. Okay. So um, you also need to create, because you are studying art history and you're always going to reference artworks. So in your case, for every assignment that you conduct, you are obviously going to have images or pictures. Um, sometimes the, those images will be reproductions of artworks, but sometimes you'll just have a photo of something that you want to include. You need to create a separate image list for that as well. So the same, so you're going to have the same applies. You'll have a separate image reference list. You'll have your bibliography and then your image reference list after that or before that. You need, you're going to have your image here. You're going to have to number them. So the standard usually is to number them figure one, figure two, figure three. And if you're using Word, Word by default wants, if you add a caption, by default it wants to make it figure. So I think that's just the easiest. And then you can explain something in your arguments. I can add a caption to sort of this um, artwork. And then in the back, now I have my image reference list. I have figure one, figure two, figure three, figure four. And then figure one, I can see uh, it was made by 
Jacques Louis David. So there's his surname. Um, this is the, a portrait. So I explain a little bit the artwork. This is specific for artworks, sculptures, original art. You explain it a little bit. So it's a portrait of Napoleon known as, and this is the title it's most known for. The reason you have to do it is because some artists, they didn't give a title to the work. And by popular demand or something later on in the after centuries of people referencing the, the artwork, they started to give it a title, but that's not the title the author gave. Or sometimes you'll have artworks that have two titles, two different titles, or sometimes you'll have an artwork, like if you think of the French Impressionists. So they have the title, uh, for example, Le Degeneres. Uh, it's a French title, but if you, have used an English book, you might have used just the English title of it. So you can, that's why you say it is known as, so you'll say um, pastoral scene of men with a naked lady known as Le Degener de Soleil, um, if you want to go the French way or whatever. Then you have to indicate the medium, so oil on canvas. Then you have to show the size. Artwork size is very important and now i have to show all artworks around the world is kept somewhere it's owned by somebody so this specific artwork is kept in the louvre the art museum the louvre it's in paris and i can find a reproduction of this image at this url um, um, there's a different method if you're going to use sort of images from Flickr or instagram there's a different way that you reference those images and I'll give you a link to how you do that as well. But this you need to do, sort of, you have to have uh, your images behind the body of the essay, figure one, two, three, four, so they don't influence, because you must, you're not creating a magazine layout. So your images shouldn't be where the text, the body of the essay is. The images is behind the body of the essay. So it's the copy, the body copy of the essay. Then it's your multiple images that you've used with their caption. Then it will be your image reference list. And then it is your bibliography. So that's the, the visual structure that your essay should take. Then, as I said, I, you are dependent on internet sources. But all internet sources aren't equal. And it's very difficult sometimes to ascertain the validity of an internet source. So there are a couple markers that can indicate to you whether or not the source is good. Um, anyone can post something on the internet and it doesn't mean that what you read is acknowledged within an academic field. So um, I would say sort of the basic rule is if you can't find an author, there's a problem. If you can't find a publishing date, you've got a problem. Um, if it's not connected to an institute, a research institute, like a university, then you've got a problem. Um, then you have to start to ask the questions. What can I find out about the author? Like if I ha do find an author, but it's not linked to any research institute, you know, has this person written a lot? Is this person a teacher? Is this person a high school pupil? It can be anybody. Um, how well do I, how well is this topic researched on this site? Is there a bias? Some, a lot of sites have opinion-based works um, and they have a certain agenda. So you have to look at what ads do I see on the site? Uh, does it, prov what's, what's the purpose of the site? Is it meant to provide information? Is it meant to persuade me? Um, there is nothing like, that does, uh, an objective source does not exist. So even in an academic field, uh, there will be a type of bias or a, a specific theoretical framework that, which it fits into. But that's why research, articles, academic journal articles, they will always tell you in the beginning, oh, this is what this is about. Um, this fits into that framework. Like I said at the beginning of the year, this fits into the framework of feminist theory. 
then I will know that this researcher has not considered other aspects that does not fall within the parameters of the of the feminist um, mystique. Um, so, yeah, if it doesn't have author publishing dates, if it's something like a social media site, I've already mentioned something like Wikipedia, uh, there are multiple authors, they're anonymous, they can go and change dates and details frequently. So that's why Wikipedia, it is okay for, for secondary, so for high school, but for tertiary research, you cannot use it anymore. The only way that you can use Wikipedia is in that one class that I showed you, is that you actually look, you, you look at the resource list at the bottom of the Wikipedia page and you click on those direct links and then from those you go to your sort of, sort of the origin of that source and you use that source that you could possibly do. Um, in general, good sources are academic journals, um, Published books are obviously the best. And then you've got soft copy versions. On online, you've got many soft copy versions of published books, um, which is sort of PDF books or eBooks. Um, you get sort of um, the Internet Archive, the Gutenberg Project. They distribute a lot of books for free that you can read online for free. So there are places that you can go and read books. Google Books also allow you to read books, like published books online. Um, so those are the kind of sources that you actually want. Now, in the grander scheme of your research, if you have one site that has uh, no specific author, but it's maybe from a museum, that's fine. But if all your sources are from anonymous, non-published, social media driven sites, then your research is becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. So just sort of keep it that balance good. Okay, and these are the um, online sources where you can find how must I reference an image, how must I reference this and that. So that I will email to you guys and you can, for your next assignment, you can see if I've got this type of source, how do I reference it? Um, okay. Uh, that's basically what I wanted to share. We went a little bit over. Um, I'm just going to hear if there are any questions. Anka, you any questions? Is it? Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, uh, say it. Good. How how was it for you? I is it is it better? Yeah, I not. Yeah, I not understood the reference. Okay, so it's better. Okay. <laughs> um. Um. Uh, I don't know who's queen. Queen. Any questions? No. Okay. Um, all right. So thanks everyone for joining me for this Harvard referencing session. Um, I know it's it's a lot to take in, but like I said in the beginning of the session, it is very important. And yeah, uh, once you just follow the rules of it, it's easy. It's just uh, yeah. So thanks everybody. Have a good day and a good week. Um, I'll try and have one more session with you guys before the break. Um, it might be at the end of this week or beginning of next week. Um, I just, I'm borrowing someone else's <laughs> earphones and microphone. Uh, so I'll just, I'll keep you uh, updated whether or the, whether the class will be on Friday um, or if it'll be on Tuesday. So um, just check out your emails. I'll send an email by Thursday, then you'll know when the next class is. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Stop.